records. While shooting his own live video, the rising rapper was spotted and signed by Capitol Records. His big break came after a flash of inspiration at an LA airport. I remember actually being on the runway taxiing, moving along, and uh, I just started humming uh, the Rick James bass line, you know, doom, 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 doom. And the words just came out of my mouth. Can't touch this. Can't touch this, doom. I say that's it, I got it. My, 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 my music hit so hard, makes me say, oh my lord, thank you. I execute moves with my entire body. When I hit it, my whole body's into the movement. And then I'll go from a power move like that to a graceful move and float. I told you. The baggy pants was a part of the whole uh, performance aspect. What they did was they flowed with my movement. So if I'm spinning around, the pants open up and, and they, they catch the wind. And it gave me a lot of freedom, you know, nice loose clothing. And Hammer was soon in a position to cram his wardrobe thanks to the great financial strides made by his new album, which in 1990 made him the best-selling rap artist of all time. I see her face that I can't let go. She's in my dreams and my heart, so let me know. Did I ever think it would sell 15, 16 million records? Nobody could think that, but, uh, but what I thought was, here's a record that can make a, a huge impact throughout the world. At the same time, a wide range of commercial activities made a huge impact on Hammer's current account. Stop. Bankrupt time. Perhaps not the sharpest tool. Hammer splashed out on one toy too many and filed for bankruptcy with debts exceeding $10 million. He also had half his hometown on the payroll. We had a, a huge show that we put on on stage. Uh, we were known for having uh, 50 people on stage uh, at one time. So that means that those 50 people were also uh, on our payroll. Most of the people uh, who were from my neighborhood who I brought with me who had no opportunities, these people are still alive today. Uh, over 90% of them are not incarcerated. They have kids. And so what is the real value of that? Got change for a dollar? I'll give you three quarters for a buck. Close enough for me. <laughs> Sucker! <laughs> Unsightly confrontations with street gamblers and monster debts behind him, these days the Hammer has restyled himself as a rapping reverend. Working with the church is first and foremost. Uh, that's what I do, uh, and then everything else comes after that. My commitment is more firm uh, and stronger and more devout than ever. We're here to celebrate Jesus. This is not about MC Hammer. Oh, yeah. I'm MC Hammer, the Hammer Man, and I'm out of here. Peace. 1990 was shaping up to be something of an international year of the trouser. But it wasn't just MC Hammer's baggy-ass pantaloons that were the culprits. In Manchester, a far more sinister move was afoot. The Flares revival. Seemingly, Manchester's Stone Roses have overnight made the leap from promising cult band to the hottest musical phenomenon of the moment. It took six years of gigs and graffiti campaigns before the world noticed these Mancunian tunesmiths. They put their hometown back on the pop map with 89's acclaimed debut album and began the decade tipped as the next Rolling Stones. Everything they touched seemed to turn to, um... that looks like um, we've had a power shortage or something so we'll move on to the next item a cynical nasty person would say that the stone roses were um, a bunch of monkey faced goths who nicked the funky drummer beat and made a load of Simon and Garfunkel records so I won't You could maybe slay Ian Brown for not always hitting a note, but as a frontman, he was fantastic. If you look at Liam Gallagher, who's an, another amazing frontman, you can see where he's taking it from. John Squire, fantastic guitarist, Manny, brilliant bassist, 
and Rennie, you know, fantastic hat wearer and brilliant drummer. They were a really great band. Your Smiths fan could understand them as well as your raver. And uh, there weren't really any other groups that had that massive crossover potential. The Stone Roses were kind of a way into rave culture for people who didn't know anything about dance music. Their pioneering fusion of sounds and sensibilities earned universal acclaim, and the band themselves were always quick to crow about their achievements. What's the best thing about the band then? first time I saw them on telly, they were sitting down, this girl was interviewing them, and she was kind of going, um, so, uh, you're a bit of a psychedelic band. And they were kind of just, there was just this silence. Ludicrous as this may seem, they seemed really threatening, you know, they seemed really hard. Hard, or just PR savvy. They began the year taking their Jackson Pollock fixation out on old record company FM Revolver over re-release material. It was the first of many record company wrangles to plague their career. The Stone Roses, now with records high in the popular music charts, have a huge following. Today's £3,000 fines are unlikely to cause them a drop in their popularity. The Roses' dour eclecticism made them hugely popular, but though 1990 was their best chart year, hype exceeded success. Because they made a really good LP, and because they were a bit naughty and threw paint around and all that, there was a lot riding on them. Whatever they did, post Fool's Gold, was seen to be a disappointment. So, no chart topper with their long-awaited single, but the Roses did stage many people's gig of the year when they organised a 30,000 set-out show at a dump in Merseyside. This island was basically poisoned by pollution in the middle of the Mersey estuary, surrounded by chemical factories in Widnes to put the rock and roll vent on the air. It was absolutely brilliant. Isn't it? People like the face and ID kind of did 10 page fashion spreads live from Spike Island, you know, so it meant something. But I think, um, in a way, it did mark the beginning of the end of the Stone Roses because, you know, they never really had that moment again. No, which may have had something to do with landing a big money deal with Geffen, then taking five bloody years to make a follow-up album. Journalists are very fond of saying that the Stone Roses lost it. No, the Stone Roses were given five million pounds. What were they supposed to do with it? They did what any sane person would have done at the time. They went to Wales and didn't come back. The reason the band fell apart is because each member was on different drugs at the same time. Drugs, late night sumo, Brown's increasingly patchy live vocals and deserting personnel led to a final messy split in 96. Since then, King Monkey's tried solitary pursuits, notably a stretch in prison for threatening to maim an air hostess. Squire went folk rock on us for a while and is solo. Manny's the strutting bass god of Primal Scream and Rennie's grown a beard. But the Stone Rose's lasting cultural legacy remains intact, even after ten years. In some ways they did everything right. They made a record that was a yardstick and, and dominated British bands the whole of that decade. So when we sit back and say what could have been and what might have been, it's irrelevant. They made a record that in 50 years' time people still be buying that record. Is there anything else you want to say? Nothing. No, yeah. Okay, thanks. Ta. That's it. And it wasn't just the Stone Roses. In 1990, the Manchester shuffling baggy beat gripped the nation's consciousness. It was like the North West had taken over. I blame bloody Coronation Street. Anyone within Matt breeding distance in Manchester was pulling on Joe Bloggs flares and hijacking the charts. If the Roses were the city's band of the year, it was the walking pharmacies that were the Happy Mondays who made the most critically acclaimed album. God knows how. Man. 
was like a wake-up call across the country that all these blokes in council estates had, who had been completely ignored for ages and ages suddenly thought, that's me, and I'm on the telly. It was all mad as fuck off our legs, you know what I mean? Here we are off our faces on your telly. Go fuck off and what you're going to do about it. It was just utterly kamikaze. I mean, someone like Bez, that's brink of death. If you think of Sean Ryder and Bez as sort of like Boswell and Dr. Johnson, you know, on this sort of like odyssey into the, the human soul, at the end of it, you know, Sean Ryder's trying to smoke his own feet and Bez is held together by surgical plates and pus. You know, fair play. In 1990, our next act, sexual sassiness, bottle blonde hair and outre wardrobe made her more, well, hen night than pop star. <laughs> Bay City, Michigan, a town which gave five Scotsmen with feather cuts their name and begat a living legend. She arrived a penniless teen serving cakes in mid-70s New York. By the end of the 80s, she was the most famous lion-shagging women's liver in the world. I've got to tell you, if you think Madonna is a feminist, Jeffrey Dahmer is a vegetarian. I think she's a feminist. She's a crusader. When she very first came out with Like a Virgin and was writhing on this gondola in Italy, I thought, what is that? And then gradually she became more and more chic. People could see that this was a woman who had a sense of humour, who wasn't taking herself too seriously, and also had a brain as well. Ching, ching, ching. Brains, balls and bras made Madonna Ciccone a superstar. As the decade turned, she cast personal crises and bubblegum pop behind her. The new look decade began with a classic, Nick from a dance in New York's underground gay clubs. Strike the pose. Madonna is a total 100% gay icon, and Vogue was the record of the year. The one thing I remember about Vogue is everybody trying to copy the routine and I think the funny thing is how many people just couldn't do it half the people look like they were just trying to swat a fly the award-winning video set the scene for the international live event of the year the box office smashing blonde ambition tour in 1990, Madonna started to look like something Ridley Scott did for a bet. The Blonde Ambition Tour, she knew what she kind of wanted to look like, so she just brought John Paul Gaultier in. You know, the conical bra, Madonna in a conical bra, is a, an image that has lasted since then. That encapsulates Madonna. Satire, a really vivid sense of show business. Not to mention shock value. Madonna's lascivious on-stage antics sparked uproar in Catholic Rome and even a call for the police in Toronto. Some people are outraged by my behaviour, but I, I was quite surprised to find out that I may possibly be arrested for my behaviour. You know, after all, it is a performance. It's a theatrical performance. and It's not like I'm going out on the street, you know, uh, running around without my clothes on. They even fully clothed. By the time 1990s Madonna mania reached Britain, the tabloids were rigid with indignation. It really was like the circus had come to town, and um, every day she she was the running soap opera in the tabloids. She was the, the posh and becks of 1990. Some guys like to talk. And here you can see Madonna being taken by Warren Beatty, to the premiere of Dick Tracy. This chapter of La Ciccone's on-off affair with Hollywood clearly had a profound effect on her songwriting. There's something to me about Hanky Panky that seems very Benny Hill. She kind of thought she could do anything, so she just took it down the kind of like, you know, let's pant a little harder, kind of, you know, just to find my love. I want to kiss you in Paris. The video's risque, but at the same time really subtle. It's really exploring female fantasy and desire. I don't want to be a mother. There's these overtones of lesbianism and slight hints of S&M as well. This is why she's monumentally famous, because she doesn't just sit there making good records, she'll go and sit on herself in public. She's, you know, she's a, a dirty girl. Wanting. 
needing, waiting for you to justify my love. Ladies, please. Ten years ago, less liberal views prevailed. The steamy clip was banned, but that only boosted sales when it was shrewdly flooded onto the retail market. Apparently it was changing hands for vast sums of money in Saudi Arabia in, in bazaars um, because it was considered um, really, really high quality porn. A multi-platinum greatest hits album capped a triumphant year. And Madonna went on working at the coalface of rampant sexuality. The artistic merits of her metal-clad coffee table book, Sex, were lost on the critics, but richly enjoyed by builders. Whoa. She was pilloried for that sex book, and she, she fought back, but it's noticeable that after that she did tone down her act quite a bit, and, um, and then really started to concentrate on the music. I never want to be taken completely seriously. I think that that's the death of anyone. 1990 was shaping up to be something of a tricky year if you happen to be a woman with your heart set on world domination. Speaking of which, a certain grocer's daughter from Grantham in Lincolnshire waved us all a tearful farewell. <laughs> but as soon as they'd got rid of her, one of Labour's greatest electoral assets had gone. Completely ruined my life. It was a monstrously silly act. I said at the time it would take the Conservative Party ten years to recover. It has. Perhaps some mathematician in the hall would care to work out just how many years it will be before it becomes impossible for the Conservative Party to win a general election. I was just um, delighted to have been a part of um, what the tabloids called the most evil thing ever to have happened to this country, which was um, house music. Welcome back to 1990, the year that Rave went mainstream mental. The culture of the Rave was recognised as being probably Britain's most potent post-war youth movement. Suddenly British people were perceived not as being very boring and very po-faced, but as being uh, arguably the most outgoing of all European young people. It was absolutely a statement that there is community and people want community and they won't have it taken away from them. And the police were used as an army to act on that. The government were fearful of raves, and our objective, uh, to be quite frank with you, was to stop as many as we could happening. I was shocked to find the disorientation amongst young people. They were wide-eyed, uh, almost wide-mouthed, arms in the air, and you feared for their own personal and moral safety. They're on the footpaths, they're in people's drives. One of the neighbours has also seen sex taking place in the garden, uh, which isn't very nice, especially if they have children. We can see the damage which is done by drugs to people, whether it's so-called soft drugs like ecstasy um, or marijuana. I don't know what it would be like if ecstasy hadn't happened. I, th I think it would have been. I think uh, the whole country would be massively different. Doors were open by that, that drug. It's as simple as that, you know. People talk about youth cults and and revolution in, in music and fashion. That was an actual mass working class revolution. There's no doubt about that. More so than punk. Yeah, it's probably the most exciting turn of events in the whole of the uh, 20th century, I would think, in music. The social changes and the cultural movement, 10 years on, has been such that it's become very acceptable. And I often wonder why we bothered. Super lighting, lovely people, and I wish him well for the future. In the view of the New Musical Express, Belgium is one of the countries which has accelerated the phenomenon of thinking differently. What? Yes, hello progressive thinkers and welcome to Belgium. Famous for its beer, its delicious chocolates, seafood, and visiting twats. 
but back in the 1980s, the Boxing Ring of Europe gave us this. Plastic! It's called New Beat, and aside from pretend ex-punks making asses of themselves, it did spawn Belgium's leading record producer. At the end of the New Beat era, you know, I was making 12-inch records the one after the other, but never with vocals. He was looking for a <laughs> black female rapper. I was the only one in the country. <laughs> so. Manuela Camosi was born in Zaire. At 17, she was rapping in Antwerp. When her Afro-tinged rhymes mated with Yo's knob twiddling, a bizarrely pronounced techno rap monster child was born. She said, yeah, I come tomorrow. I'll uh, write something down this evening. And she told me she worked 15 minutes writing down the lyrics. Came the next day and we recorded Pump Up The Jam. Changed our lives. <laughs> The jam, pump it up, why your feet are stumping, and the jam is pumping, look ahead, the crowd was 89 when the record came out, but it turned out to be a hit in 90. It was the beginning of the rise of Europe as a credible force in music, and I think actually that's one of the things that the 90s might be best remembered for, was the fact that uh, suddenly the pop, pop, the pop world uh, became much more wide open, and hey, Someone from Belgium could have a hit, and, and you weren't laughed at. Well, we may not have actually laughed, but we were confused. Bonafide singer Yar Kid K had been usurped by a lycra-clad miming disaster called Feli. Manuela didn't really want to do promotion and, you know... So the Belgian record company decided to have it promoted by a professional model. I mean, the next thing you know, guys came to me and said, hey, your record is in the store, and there's this naked girl on it like that. And I'm like, ah. Feli told everybody that she had sung it. She probably believed it herself in the end, but she couldn't speak a word of English. She spoke French. She couldn't sing. In the Get Up video, they had decided to have both of us in there and to sort of fade her out and fade me in so as to not confuse the public or whatever. That's why you have her in the video lip syncing the background vocal. And with her phony forerunner duly dispatched back to the catwalk, Yarkid K now stepped up to drive the Tronics lyrical panzer. Get up, get up, get busy, do it, get up and move that body, get up people not get down to God before the night is over. These aren't exactly songs, they're more like chants, huh? You know. Not all pop records have to be earnest, excising and like understanding the music. I mean sometimes you just want a yobbish slab of sound to just go crazy to. Maybe Technotronic understood that, I hope they understood that, I hope they were doing it on purpose, I hope they weren't, uh, that's all they could come up with, uh, sort of five days, have you got a better lyric? Yeah, no, stuck, stuck on this one, man. I deliberately made Get Up as a follow-up on uh, Pump Up The Jam. Uh, I used the same bass sound, same synth sound. Of course you can't do that ten times in a row, so I'd only did it once, and then I changed. This beat is, this beat is, this beat is Technotronic. Okay. The hits kept coming and while Yo shunned the limelight, the public face of Technotronic was completed by a bloke called Eric from Wales. Tidy. The Technotronic situation was a situation that my manager brought to me and said to me, look, these guys, you know, they need someone to, 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 to rap and to write, so are you interested? And I was like, okay, cool, because I just wanted to get on the mic. I didn't care. You know, you could have put me on a tune with Pavarotti, mate. I wouldn't even have mattered to me. Thankfully, it was a somewhat more svelte companion sharing Tony the Tiger pyjama duty, as the band wailed leading world entertainment figures. Even Madonna was a fan, and invited them to open for her on tour. Somebody said to me, Eric, how does it feel to be the first person on stage at the Blonde Ambition tour in front of like 40,000 people? And I was like, <clears throat> excuse me. On the road, romance blossomed between the two rappers and soon Manuela was feeling dicky, but for very different reasons. This is it. Oh, hang on a second. This is it. What's this here? Manuela's cap. All right, well, there we are. I was pregnant. I was, get on stage, throw up, get on stage, and then come off the stage, throw up, get back on stage. Yo, yo, DJ, spin 
that wheel. The hits, not to mention the pools of vomit, dried up all too soon, and the original Technotronic sadly parted. The Arkid K went solo and soundtracked the craze movie of the year. Eric has now relaunched himself as a hotly tipped rapper, Me One. Sort of an opposite of you two when you think about it. While the mysterious Mr. Bogart still enjoys his royalties and making records, this new track marks the return of Yo and Yarkid K as a pop item, ten years since they first pumped their way into the nation's hearts. Naturally enough, as rave became more commercially successful, it somehow became less hip. But still, the same things were there. Thousands of strangers in the middle of a field, standing, disorientated, wondering why they're there. A bit like one man and his dog. Hello, I'm Adamski and this is Dis, the dog. Adamski was kind of at the forefront of uh, a little subculture that existed as a parallel universe to the DJs of one man and their keyboard. It was so sort of cheapskate the way it was done. He had like a, a number plate made up which said Adamski and um, that comprised his live performance. England's answer to child prodigy Amadeus was Adam Tinley, a young man who first hit the big time in 1979 at the age of 10. I had a strong feeling that I was just meant to make music, so I made this little record with my little brother on a tape recorder. like number three in the alternative charts I used to speak to John Peel which was quite exciting for little boy <laughs> I was quite annoying kid and having a record out and being on telly stopped everyone from beating me up I think Adam soon grew up and left such childish pleasures behind him before founding squat punk outfit Discord that called along with fellow frontman Johnny Slut we used to drink quite a lot. Our favourite place to play was this party in uh, the Rio Cinema in Dalston called The Mix. I always used to take my little dog, Dis, who's um, sadly not with us anymore. And we used to change costumes in Wendy houses and my dog used to poo everywhere. <laughs> that was kind of where I was coming from. Adam retreated to do the dusting above this kebab house in Camden Town, while fellow fast food fan Seal Henry Samuel served burgers just up the road. Believe it or not, I, I enjoyed a two-week period at McDonald's in Kentish Town. <laughs> and that, that, that was an experience. And it wasn't long before the two met and joined forces in a terrible experiment. He said that I should meet him in a studio in... Hammersmith the next day and he played me this backing track and he said well I've got these lyrics called the killer and I was like that's coincidence because I've got this song this music called killer and and it just so happened to fit together so unemployed. I was on the uh, Enterprise Allowance Scheme. I was actually number one on top of the pops and I was getting my rent paid. And hopefully I can say that on television without some bit of vindictive little man coming round and asking me for his £45 back. drinking special brew in a bed sit to cocaine champagne computer punk in about three weeks. Communications between Adamski and myself kind of broke down because there, were, there was lots of politics involving the record company. They were going to promote the record as Adamski, which presented a bit of a problem considering that I not only co-wrote 
the, the song, but I was also singing on it. I think what was confusing about Killer was that no one knew quite who Adamski was. I think a lot of people thought that Adamski was Seal or that Seal was Adamski. It was, a, it was very, very confusing. And if you'd taken a lot of E that summer, um, I, don't, I don't think you would have had a clue about that record. Really good. He made some great pop records and he had, he had a really good vision, didn't he? He's like a little space pixie, really. What he know? Do he lost it? And he did really lose it big style, didn't he? <laughs> um. He was sweet, like, but his brain was mashed, you know. Uh. You couldn't get a conversation out of him, and I felt really, I felt a bit sorry for him, really. Seal taught me how to fry an egg properly. I'm always being debted to him for that. I didn't know you were supposed to put the saucepan lid over the top, so I'd always get it a bit burnt on the bottom and runny on top. And um, he, he was really, really good at that sort of thing. Adamski soldiered on solo, but ultimately failed to scale the dizzy heights he reached with Killer. I just wouldn't stick to a formula and I like to take risks. I probably really pissed off the record company. I'd made a big pig's ear of everything. He should have had. Adamski, meanwhile, tiring of Britain's dodgy kebabs and bitter, twisted social security officials, has relocated to Bologna where he raises his daughter, records new material, and looks forward to a future playing the dad. The children are, the children are the children. They're, 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 they're the, uh, <laughs> they're the children. Take the following two disparate elements here. We have German house music, and here we have a Lancashire nightclub. Let's unify the two, like our next turn did. On Rusty! I'm gonna be snickering you, snickering you tonight's big break! Have you noticed how John Virgo's changed, you know, personality-wise since the first series? No, not the badger with the cue. John Virgo is actually the pseudonym for a Frankfurt resident called Luca, who in 1990 produced Germany's biggest ever dance export. I'm very, very proud of it, uh, just to know that just for a split second, you just rock the world, you know, it's like... Snap's heavyweight frontman, Turbo B, was originally an American GI based in Frankfurt, whose extracurricular activities included rapping in local nightclubs. Turbo used to do this really cool beatbox routine. I saw him and I said, I gotta do something with, with him. You know, until people was like, you know, just going crazy about it. I was over in Amsterdam in 1990 playing at a club which still exists now called Matzo and somebody played it and I literally was ready to bend down and um, take it in the wrong place if they'd be prepared to give me that record, I so wanted it. The power's success was all the more remarkable as it made it to the top without any sort of marketing campaign. You know, everything exploded. The power was number one in Britain with no video. We're playing a record exclusive. I'm telling you, this could be a number one record. We've never played a record as hot as this. It's snap, and you got the power. And we've got the power here at the Ritzy in Burnley. If the track is good and it's well received, it has a crossover potential from the underground into the mainstream. All he has to do is be in the shops. The reaction was the same everywhere, all over the world. It just would seem to be an aerobics tune. That if you, you know, you kind of walk past the gym and you just see thousands of women kind of working out to them, I've got the power. I just think of it like that, you know, kind of unstretch and power, you know, reach power. 
It's easy to knock things in retrospect when they were popular and went to number one, but the truth is that came through via the underground and uh, progressed all the way up to the pinnacles of the chart. Their next hit firmly established Snap in the pop marketplace, repeating the power's winning formula of female vocals combined with Turbo B's outsized rap. This is the song about the fantasy. Start out happy and then the fantasy. I personally think he's definitely one of the best rappers around. Turbo speaks for himself. He's very, very fast. Should I talk to her now? Yes. As a matter of fact, I think he has become a blur. Now or never. Pedal car Turbo B. He was a prodigiously slow rapper. I think I'm like the, the James Brown of dance music, man. The godfather of dance music rap, man. Somebody, I go my, uh, I go, I go, I go away. Uh, somebody, I go my, uh, somebody, I go my, uh, somebody, I go my, uh, I go, I go, I go away. Snap managed to keep it going for a couple of albums, which is very difficult within the world of dance music, littered with one-hit wonders as it is. However, the shit hit the Turbo fan after reports of homophobic comments made by Turbo when he was manhandled at a gay Boston night spot. In America, it's, uh, it got really out of control. Uh, gays picketing the record shops, do not buy Snap, and it was really out of control. I remember he was this big guy, he talked shite. Turbo walked into more trouble during Snap's dance floor anthem Rhythm is a Dancer when the following rhyme landed him back in hot water. I'm serious as cancer when I say rhythm is a dance. I'm as serious as cancer when I say that rhythm is a dancer. Um, well, there is a country argument. No, you're not. I mentioned to him, I said, look, uh, you sure you don't want to revise that line and say something else and you know he declined and uh, if if he can live with that then so can I Give me a regardless of lyrical transgressions turbo remains at snaps helm but ten years on the big man is somewhat bemused by current music trends don't make plans for dinner the music right now is, is so complicated and everybody's trying to put so many drum beats you know at a time and, and so many sounds and so it was basic People like basic, you know? Here's a grilled ham and cheese sandwich, it's basic. We don't need the garnish, we don't need the, the fancy name, we just want the damn ham and cheese. I've got the power. Power. Well, the Germans might have started making good pop music 10 years ago, but in 1990, where would the good old English sense of righteous self-indignation have been without a doomed penalty shootout? After 90 minutes of sharing hell, you're gonna get thirsty. I met John Barnes, and instead of shaking his hand, I went, did, 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 Women in particular suddenly knew who everybody was. It wasn't about kicking a bloody ball around a bit of mud. It was about their characters. Well, you know, Gascoigne was collapsing in front of you. You know, Linnacle was going like that. You know, he's lost it. And also, we nearly did it. And England, sad, sad, sadly are out. We have Millie Vanilli on the show. Our right arseholes. Complete <laughs> those arseholes. So I went and beat them up. Beat them up? But Pete, you're a steam enthusiast. Worse was to come for the Dread Duo when they also got clobbered for their old gotten Grammy Award when it turned out they hadn't sung a note. Tragically, Rob Pilatus ended up committing suicide. Lesser victims were Bross, whose rabid spend frenzy was soon to leave them potless. And five star our very own rubbish Jacksons, who by 1990 already were. Hey, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Others wandered down the crossroad, made a pact with the devil and remained regrettably solvent. Hi, Bunny. Nice to meet you. Of course, 1990 had its share of tragedies. We lost Max Wall, Terry Thomas, and the great Jim Henson, creator of The Muppets. But no need to worry, because waiting in the wings was more than enough talent to fill the void. Where have you come from? Come from Tower Bridge. From Tower Bridge. Yeah. Have you got a special message for the boys? Just say that I love them and they're great and forget what all the critics say about them. They're the best. What, what do the critics say about them then? They say that they're crap and they're all this shit. What do you think of New Kids on the Block? I'm, I don't know about New Kids on the Block. <laughs> New Kids on the Block, weren't they just a toothpaste advert? I can't remember any of the tunes they thought. They were American, weren't they? Uh, yes, Bez, that's right. New Kids on the Block were the terrifying Yankee Doodle brainchild of boy pop guru Maurice Starr, the man behind early 80s quintet, New Edition. A manager can ruin your career or make your career. Most managers ruin people's careers because they have no clue of what to do. Maurice sure knew stars when he saw them, but it still took five years of relentless promotion for his fresh-faced Boston strugglers to boast the biggest pants in pop. New Kids on the Block, or NTPOX, whatever they were called, um, can be blamed for beginning boy bands as we know them today, because they were the first white boy band, which meant they removed um, the sort of musical bit and just became sort of five boys all going like that, and then like that and uh, lame, really lame sort of hip-hop dancing. You just did get the impression they were just a bunch of kind of stage school misfits and they were kind of brought in in order of height, you know, we have the big one and then we have that the little cutie one with the curly hair. I was a little goofball, you know, everyone's kid, little brother, and, and I was cute, and then um, Donnie was a tough guy. Jordan was the slick, smooth, movie star looks kind of guy. John was the quiet one. And Danny was... Um, Danny was Herman Munster with tonsillitis. But despite this handicap, by 1990, the kids' apple pie image was winning slavering adulation from both screaming girls and their impressionable dads. They don't do any lewd acts on the stage like a lot of the other uh, popular rock groups and uh, just, I believe, good, clean uh, musical entertainment. The new kids on the block thing I never took serious. And it was quite obvious that it was a, a complete sham. Kids didn't care. They just saw five hunky guys leaping about and looking trendy. And, they, you know, they marketed it right. And it worked. Pretty desperate, I thought. But, I mean, if kids want it, they want it. Step by step. Ooh, baby. Their records were so bad as for me not to remember them. And I really like pop music. I can't remember a single New Kids on the Block one at all. I had to interview them, and they were all really boring. In fact, I remember one of them said, are we in a place called London, Paris? Mm -hmm. I think that was Jordan, actually. Are there certain things that you want to see here? Uh, yeah, we want to see everything, but I we want to see really stone, Stonehenge. Is that how you call it? <laughs> you mustn't let them talk. There's no need for them to talk. It's so very simple. You want a boy band. Shut up and look good. Indeed, most fanciable male and just about every other teen voted gong was theirs but they'd never again hit the heights of that year. In 91, they split from their songwriting guru and, surprise, surprise, their popularity duly nosed on. I think we should write a lot of this stuff as time goes on. But they have to remember, if there's no hit in the bunch, then they put the rope around their own neck. You better turn that fire down, please. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. you. Partner all. <laughs> yes, okay, I heard. They'd risen to become Rusty Lee's slaves after false claims of arson antics. By 94, the new kid circus had waved its sorry last goodbye. <laughs> they were huge, obviously. They were massive. But now, who even thinks about new kids on the block? 
Well, for those of you who do, Donnie's now an actor like brother Marky Mark. He shot Bruce Willis, you know. Jordan went top five on his Todd last year. And Joey's also plotting a solo career, while the other two are forgotten, albeit rich, old kids. In the era of NSYNC and Backstreet Boys, we don't even, nobody even remembers them. Boy, they suck! Well, we've just about finished construction of our cultural canary wharf tonight, but before we reveal to you who resides in the glass pyramid at its summit, let's have a look back at nine of the other inhabitants. Look at the nuts on that, Vanilla Ice at number 10. Ooh, Betty, it's number 9 who made us all do a whoopsie. At 8, loads of pants, MC Hammer. At 7, Moody Mank Monkeys, the Stone Roses. At 6, having a global hen night, Madonna. Technotronic, pump up the preserve at 5. At 4, one man, his dog, the occasional seal. Turbo-powered Frankfurters, at 3. And carry on screaming, new kids are the runners-up. So just who was the most successful chart act of 1990? The answer is not a band. It's not even a solo artiste. I think it was the ink spots that said, soap gets in your eyes. When in this particular case, it got in your ears. Not to mention, up your nose. <laughs> Leave it. The landlady with the horny mum good looks is not our number one, but her 86 hit paved the way for fellow soap stars to top the charts. And by 1990, they all seemed to come from one street on the other side of the planet. Neighbors, everybody needs good neighbors. The soaps had changed because they were Australian, happy, um, you know, sunny soaps. You know, they were very different from things like Coronation Street. Thought you'd be breaking your neck to start earning some money. Hmm. And who said we're going to be earning any money? Oh yes, behold 1990's Queen. King. And Bonnie Prince Harry of Australian soap pop. 1990, the thing I remember was a f I was to say, but I think the, the weather had an influence that year on pop music. I mean, you know. There we were with three Australians, and it was almost like they'd brought the weather with them. Any musical trivia buffs out there who wish to trace this amazing transition from soap stars to pop stars, you have to step back two whole years. I was with Kyla at the time, and you know, I'd never forget her receiving a phone call at about six o'clock in the morning once, saying I should be so lucky was number one in the UK. To me, that sort of sparked massive amounts of jealousy. Uh, maybe it's because I was in love with her. Every single record company in this country was offered that record and turned it down. You know, people said you couldn't take a TV star into being a pop star, particularly an Australian TV star. You know, you can't do no promotion. Now, you can't do better promotion than twice a day on the BBC with ten and a half million people, but nobody... It just pulsated the juices of the kids, and it's exactly what the media's about, tantalise them, you know. They're going to use the fuck out of you, you know, so why not use the fuck out of them? Floyd worked. As the new decade began, the Minogue, Donovan, Stock, Aitken and Waterman bubblegum pop steamroller was crushing everything in its sights, and Jason's red coat was literally everywhere. So I've never seen girls fainting the way they did for any other pop star. I mean, they were just fainting one after another. Yeah. Hundreds and hundreds of girls fainting. Aren't you dead jealous? They got my breath and tried to sell that as a sort of page five competition. I think they were going to do my stools at one point. Speaking of which... By the end of the year, quality control had gone AWOL, and so had guaranteed top five hits. The problem with pop is you think it's going to last forever, mate. 
you think you are going to be in the charts for the rest of your life. And we sold a lot of records with Jason, but nowhere near the Kylie Minogue volume. Because Kylie was the kid next door. Jason was the one they fancied, or the girls, but, you know, Charlene was their mate. And 1990 was another massive year for the tiny queen of pop, although that wholesome girl next door image was abruptly ditched for something more edgy. In 1990, or around that time, she met Michael Hutchins, who's really well known as a corrupter of um, corruptible young ladies. And she suddenly, well, for a start, she suddenly got a really good look. And she was looking a little bit out of it. And you were thinking, blimey, Kylie. Michael coming along injected that sort of, you know, spurt in her, her sort of um, um, jealous. I, I couldn't help but honestly tell you, Michael Hutchins was probably a hero of mine at the time. Hey, hey, more, more. Blah, 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 blah. Hey, more Tragically, too long in the sun and possibly a portion of bad clams caused pop star disease in other members of the Neighbours cast. Notably, Henry Aircat Ramsey. Craig was so overcome, he defected to rival soap home and away to play a teacher called, wait for it, Grant Mitchell. Are you in Neighbours? Here's a microphone. Do your worst. It shouldn't really be allowed. Can you just imagine now if people from Crossroads were suddenly given microphones and, and given unlimited fi financial uh, backing? It is a disaster. Gonna make a feel good. You're not wrong there, mate. Sadly, not all cast members enjoyed lucrative recording contracts, though. Bouncer the dog, seen here in the infamous drug-fueled Bouncer's Dream episode, sadly passed away before putting paw to paper or even recording any doggy pop. We who will never again hear him burst through our front doors with his unflagging energy and that special smile. Oh, behave yourselves, it's only a dog. Of course, if you can become a Hollywood superstar, yes, it's him in Neighbours, why would you want to arse around with Stock Aitken and Waterman? Ironically, Jason turned down old friend Guy Pearce's role in Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, and focused instead on London's West End, of course, home of all the finest drama. A High Court jury awards the pop star and actor Jason Donovan £200,000 in libel damages. When people start throwing a, a campaign that no one takes responsibility for, I'm going to come and sue your ass off, mate. And I did, and I won. At a price. The face had wrongly outed Jason as gay, but his reaction to this lost him many gay fans. He isn't homophobic, he wasn't gay. It was just him saying, look, hang on a second, this is my private life. Stop calling me a hypocrite, stop calling me a liar, and let me live my life. Look, it's well into the night now, and yeah. you're still going strong. How do you keep it up? Cocaine. It was the face. It was that whole gay backlog. Yes, it was bad, but I don't think it was as bad as the press painted out it to be. <laughs> no, 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 don't worry. It's a scene from a movie Jason did about premiership footballers. His ambitions lie in film, but even today, Jason's a theatreland darling. After a decade of mixed fortunes, Kylie's now omnipresent derriere finally got her back to number one. And this year, Jason finally discovered one drug that can keep even him out of trouble. It's called being a father. That's my best project and probably my uh, greatest year other than 1990, actually. Um, at 32, what can I say? You know, life's complete. That can't have been 10 years ago. What a depressing thought. Even more depressing, it's the end of our show. Thanks for tuning in. We'd like to leave you with a record that didn't quite top the national charts, didn't even make our charts the year, if not the decade. And then I